welcome back to Talk to Harry. My name is Sarah Sugitan, and for the second part of the show, we are going to talk about dynasties and development. Alam na alam yung huya ng ating host ay napakalakas ng anti-dynasty sentiment. Mr. Harry Tambuatko really believes that development and dynasties don't seem to go together. And to, in this show, we have a very special guest from Task Force Anti-Apeco, Mr. Jerry Cruz. Welcome to the show, Jerry. Hi, Sarah. Good to meet you. Okay, uh, you are with this task force that is against, well, the Aurora Pacific Economic Zone. Now, let us assume we don't know anything about this Aurora Pacific Economic Zone. What is it? Where is it? And what is it supposed to do? All right. APECO stands for the Aurora Pacific Economic Zone and Freeport Authority, mm -hmm. which is essentially a 12,923-hectare mega project, which is situated in the town of Kasiguran, Aurora. 12,000 hectares? 12,923 hectares, close to 13,000 hectares. Wow, it's huge, huge, huge development. Oh, huge anyway. development, which is basically, if you want to boil it down to the nuts and bolts, mm -hmm. we are opposing it precisely because it will kick out mm -hmm. more than 3,000 families from lands which they have tilled, taken care of, and also cultivated for several generations. Mm -hmm. So APECO was actually created in 2010. Mm -hmm. It was effectively an amendment of RA 9490, which was mm -hmm. passed by Congressman, Governor, mm -hmm. and Senator Angara. Mm -hmm. So in 20 2009, they actually passed a law which actually amended the original mm -hmm. uh, Aurora Special Economic Zone, which was originally 500 hectares, mm -hmm. to 12,923 hectares. That's oh, 24 that's times. Increase. 24 times, actually, exponential increase. There were no consultations which were conducted throughout this process. There were no feasibility studies. There were no floor debates. In fact, when the when the entire measure was being passed in the Senate, the, de the Department of Finance actually declared that there should be a moratorium on Freeport and Echo Zone. Mm -hmm. In spite of all of this, they continued mm -hmm. to railroad the bill, creating it, mm -hmm. and thus putting the lives of more than 3,000 families at risk. Mm -hmm. So it came to you as a surprise that from the 500 uh, on the original 500 hectare development, it became 24 times more exponentially bigger, and now there was no consultation involved. It is going to displace 3,000 families, as yes. you mentioned. Well, to be specific, probably it may displace 3,000 families. We are sure mm. it will affect 3,000 families within the area spanned over there as well as adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. But with regards to specific number of families that will be directly affected, mm. that's still to happen in the future. And anyone can really, it's anyone's guess how many will be affected. Mm. We're sure if you're taking a look at those who will be adversely affected, it will be clearly more than 3,000. More than 3,000? Okay. But these are indigenous families or uh, inclusive of the indigenous it, communities? It's four sectors, basically. Mm -hmm. Those four are sectors. IPs, the Kasiguran Agtas. Mm -hmm. Those are small fisher folk, mm -hmm. lowland farmers, and upland farmers. So mm -hmm. of all of those combined, that's the, the 3,000 family number mm -hmm. that we're currently citing right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, you are opposing the law mainly because there were no consultations involved. But I would think, I would think, Jared, that since this is an economic development zone, that they should have a plan for for eradicating these families, providing yes. them with livelihoods. Have you looked at that angle? Is that something that is in the law, for example? Well, this is actually also one reason why we're opposing the law. In fact, ever since 2010, mm -hmm. there have been at least 28 fisher folk families who have been kicked out of the, their residences without ample relocation. So in that way, mm -hmm. the creation of this law and the procedure with which it was established also very much violates the fisheries code. Mm -hmm. I mean, we oppose it first. It does not it did not gain the LG approval, mm -hmm. which violates the local government code. It did not get the free, prior, and informed consent of the Kasiguran Agtas, mm -hmm. a fact which the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples has acknowledged since 2011. Mm -hmm. So that's another violation of the IPRA, mm -hmm. Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act. Ah, okay. There's also opposed as the CARPER, mm -hmm. the CARP, and also the Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act, wow. precisely by transgressing into more than 500 hectares mm -hmm. of prime agricultural land. Mm -hmm. There's also graft and corruption involved. If you take a look at the buying and selling processes, there was this um, Penro, Provincial Environmental and Natural okay. Resource Officer. His name was Penro Benjamin Minya. Mm. During the early days of Opeco, he was actually buying land from all of these so-called small farmers, mm. buying them for around 50,000 pesos, selling them for 700,000 pesos. Mm. Oftentimes, misusing police institutions, he would bring local police with authorities him. along with him to harass and intimidate the these also. small farmers to selling the lands to him, which he would thereafter sell to Apeco. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, there's this entire chain of conflict of interest, mm -hmm. a lack of consultation, a great democratic deficit, mm -hmm. and a fact which shouldn't be underscored 
from then, 2007, when the first Aurora Special Economic Zone was created up to the present, no feasibility studies whatsoever, no approval by NEDA. We have this in the documents, we can prove this. Mm -hmm. why, why would the local government, for example, of Aurora, why would they want to have an economic zone in their area? Is it supposed to help them? I mean, uh, from what you mentioned, most of the families living in Aurora are fisher folk and farmers. So yes. that's their main source of living. So I would think that's the main industry yes. in that area as well. So why would you put an economic zone somewhere where the people are earning their livelihood from uh, fishing and from farming? Is that yes. incompatible? Os or? Well, ostensibly, the reason why they're actually creating this zone is precisely to so-called develop the area. But that's actually one of the things which is really um, questionable also. They want supposedly to create this, they want to draw in investors, they want mm -hmm. to create jobs supposedly, so that the livelihoods and the well-being of the people there, the farmers, fishers, folk, IPs will improve. Mm -hmm. um, the big question is that you're talking about people mm -hmm. who are uneducated, mm -hmm. they're some of the poorest of the poor. During Ramos's time, Aurora was one of the 20th, 20, 20 poorest provinces in the country. Mm -hmm. They have hardly any technical skills whatsoever. Mm -hmm. This basically renders them incapable of factory work, mm -hmm. incapable of working in s under standard investment jobs, so mm -hmm. to speak. So in other words, you cannot hire them. If, if the economic zone uh, materializes, you cannot hire the fisher folk and the, uh, and, uh, and the farmers because they are not equipped to perform, as you said, factory work or even office jobs. Yes. You will be essentially taking away from their livelihood or what they grew up to, to know, to, I mean, to what, what their livelihood basically. So uh, how come this escaped the attention of the country is that something correct to to say that uh, uh, atten escape the attention in what way do you mean? Yes, uh, how how come this law was passed when, as you said, it violated so many other laws, so many procedures. There, uh, there are a lot of authorities that were overlooked, uh, permissions that were not granted or sought. So uh, how come this became a law all of a sudden? Yeah, I think if you're going to really look at the core problem behind this, the mm -hmm. theme of this segment of the show is dynasties and development. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what happens when you have a political dynasty mm -hmm. that monopolizes political power. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is that if we take a look at how they were able to pass this law, first of all, Congressman Juan Edgardo Angara, Sonny, who's now running for Senate, Governor Belia Florangara Castillo, mm -hmm. Senator Edgardo Angara, they all hold key posts and several other family members, like the mayor of Baler, the capital of Aurora, mm -hmm. Arturo oh, Angara, several other family members, they all have relatives all over the place. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is that when you have a dynasty mm -hmm. that can actually hold all of these government positions, it's so easy for them to pass a law like this mm -hmm. without actually passing through the proper governmental and democratic procedures. Mm -hmm. The fact is, no people were consulted precisely because they are the government. Mm -hmm. They supposedly represent the people. the people. They can pass it without consulting them. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is... Um, but what, you, what should you do about it? I mean, the task force anti Apeco is set up precisely yes. to oppose the, uh, well, how, you should, how do you say it, the 100% materialization of the project? Or are you just opposing it? You just like to have the law repealed, for example, or um, opened up again for debate, etc. cetera? What, what is the We're the really project campaigning about? for the abolition of the mm -hmm. project. We believe that if you're talking about this from a development perspective, especially development for those from the bottom, the poor farmers, mm -hmm. fisher folk, IPs, the evidence, if you check other economic zones, it does not stand to scrutiny. Mm -hmm. They don't exactly help those from the grassroots. We actually conducted research on this. We went to Cavite. Mm -hmm. The people who actually are residents, mm -hmm. they went to Cavite to look at how eco zones over there actually function. Mm -hmm. What they found out, the, or the original inhabitants of Cavite, mm -hmm. the farmers over there, again, in the 1980s and the 1990s, mm -hmm. they were basically evicted from their land, oftentimes by violence and force, under the promise that they will be able to be mm -hmm. hired by the echo zone afterwards. It turns out they were not able to be hired, mm -hmm. precisely for what you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. They don't have the skills. They're disqualified. So in the end, what happened to the people who were originally there? They don't have land anymore. Mm -hmm. They don't have jobs. What's available for them to do? You're in echo zone, you're in, you're in an industri industrial area, there's a lot of garbage. Mm -hmm. they, get, they became effectively scavengers, mm -hmm. trash scavengers. Mm -hmm. They effectively got involved in a lot of illegal activities because that is the only way to survive. Mm -hmm. So when you actually take a look at the evidence and you take a look at this, this is in Cavite, you take a look at Cagayan, mm -hmm. the Cagayan Special Economic Zone, same, the same story, mm -hmm. car smugglers reign supreme over there as far as we've heard. Mm -hmm. Where are the local people? Mm -hmm. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would, I would imagine, well, as you said, that the title of this segment is Dynasties and Development. 
if uh, in what you said, the way that they railroaded the, the law in order to create this economic zone, also is a testament to the fact that if they if there is political will, they can do whatever they want in a specific uh, location, like in Aurora. However, it works in the reverse here because it is actually against the interests of the people of Aurora. I would, I mean, from based on what you're what yes. you're telling me, but. Should we close our eyes totally to development and just let the indigenous peoples be, etc.? What, sh what should be the alternative? What kind of development should there be? I mean, when it comes to, for example, the Philippines, we have indigenous peoples all over, okay? And, and as you said, in Cavite, they became, I, I mean, those who used to own land, whether or not they're indigenous, are now, they are ill-equipped to take on any desk job or any industrial job because they are, well, first and foremost, they are, they are fisher folk, they are farmers, and that's, that's not an easy skill to learn even. Uh, and if you take away these jobs from them, there's nothing left for them but to, well, as you said, to become trash hunters or trash scavengers. And so what kind of quality of life is that that we're giving to the people? It's, these are our leaders <laughs> making these kinds of you know, economic conditions to the people that they're supposed to serve. So should we close our eyes to development? To in actually, Aurora? that's one of the main points we're actually making. If you're trying to pass a kind of development, that really is going to benefit the people of Kasiguran, especially the poor, you actually have to look further into what they're actually doing, doing. what are their livelihoods. When you find out, you look at the history, um, the kind of thing that the people behind the PECO are suggesting that these people are just there, mm -hmm. they're not doing anything, they're just vegetating around, not making any kind of improvement whatsoever, that's false. Mm -hmm. It really stands, what, what the evidence really is, ever since the 1990s, there have been government projects there has been like an Aurora Integrated Area Development Project, which was meant to provide the area with a lot of irrigation and mm -hmm. infrastructure mm -hmm. to, uh, so as to really transform the area into an agricultural hub. Mm -hmm. The government poured money into this. There are agrarian reform communities, which means that uh, um, CLOA beneficiaries, landowners, 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 new landowners who mm -hmm. were given lands by the government, mm -hmm. they were actually given a lot of support services as well by the government. The municipal Bureau of Fisheries mm -hmm. has also organized many of the small fisher folk to actually help preserve the pristine area of the Kasiguran Bay. And the Kasiguran Bay actually needs these fishers to be able to do that rather than what a peca will do. Mm -hmm. Because these, this area has rare bluefin tuna, it's a gestation hub for tuna, it has dolphins, it has pawican, it has, it has, um, it has well, dugongs it's also, it's all these endangered it's species. So the fishermen are in fact the ones who take care of it and make sure it's all sustainable. Finally, if you even take a look at what the IPs are doing, mm -hmm. sure, they have their traditional ways of living, but actually at the same time, there have been other people who have been helping them mm -hmm. with the support of the IPs. They've been creating special education facilities mm -hmm. precisely for the IPs. Mm -hmm. There have been special forestry and livelihood projects for the IPs. Mm -hmm. Do you need an echo zone mm -hmm. to be able to, to improve the livelihoods of all of these people? If you take a look from the evidence, mm -hmm. you don't need it. In fact, they're happy without it. They need development, sure, but they've already begun taking it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly our point. Mm -hmm. If there's going to be development, it has to begin primarily from the people at the grassroots, mm -hmm. rather than being put over the top of their heads mm -hmm. like ha pies in the sky, mm -hmm. pies in the skies, which have no rules whatsoever. Should not be imposed. Yeah. Should not be imposed from the top, mm -hmm. come from the bottom. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that the people over there, they know exactly, mm -hmm. but you have to engage with them so that they can actually own the project. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. something which accords with what they know mm -hmm. and what they experience. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very important what you said, that just because uh, a large uh, uh, parcel of land, uh, 12,000 hectares, is occupied by indigenous peoples and uh, fisher folk and farmers, it doesn't mean that they are not doing something productive for the economy. They're actually doing something very productive, but we should give them the support that they need, yes. which is, as you said, it conforms, uh, I would imagine to the natural design of the community as well. There's, uh, it's very rich in marine life, and there are, there are a lot of farmers also in that area. So we should support them rather than imposing something that th this is what you should do. We should have factories here. We should convert your ancestral domain into, into, into all this industrial uh, uh, economic zone, in, into this economic zone, which is, which is just unnatural for me, <laughs> I, I would say. So it, it's really very inconsistent, and I would imagine the longer that we delay any proper response to this, then nothing's, it's going to be a deadlock. They can't proceed with their so-called economic zone. And uh, well, the farmers and the fisher folk uh, will, you know, will it will deter them from being <laughs> further productive. Uh, exactly. What has the government done so far yes. uh, with your advocacy? Well, um, before we go first to what the government has done, I think 
there was a recent news release which came out. Mm. It came from Secretary Balasakan of NEDA, who is supposed to be currently be conducting a review of Apeco. Mm. But the very interesting thing which Secretary Balasakan said, if you take a look at what's happening now with Philippine agriculture, we need to develop Philippine agriculture. It needs to grow by 4% mm. every year for the next two years if we're, if we, we're at least going to have a shot of meeting the Millennium Development Goals, which mm. is essentially having poverty mm. in the country. What's happened in the agricultural sector, though, is because of policies like this, APECO, mm. where you prioritize industrial, development. commercial, mm. development projects rather than agriculture. Ever since 1990, um, basically agriculture has shrunk by half. 1990, I've taken, ta taken a look at the statistics. It was around 22% of our country's GDP mm. in 1990. But by this year, it's now 11%, half. half. Mm. So the problem is, as you were saying earlier, these people mm. are making a productive contribution. Mm. But the reason why they're poor is it because they're only poor and rinse up, or have they been neglected mm. by our government? I'm not saying that what the government has contributed before and is 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 unappreciated, mm -hmm. but just imagine if they were to, to boost their to boost the support that they already mm -hmm. have. These people, the rice that they, they provide, Kasiguran mm -hmm. produces 16,881 wow. metric tons of rice every year, and this goes all throughout Central Luzon. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just as an estimate of how the much this is. It, mm -hmm. it can provide rice mm -hmm. for the around 118,000 families mm -hmm. for every meal for one entire year. That's an actually a significant number, as Kasiguran, because of what these government interventions in the past, mm -hmm. they actually promote, turn Kasiguran into a hub like that. We need to really reinvigorate this kind of development which is happening there. And Secretary Balasakan himself said, if we're going to have a development strategy, it has to start by improving the livelihoods of people from the grassroots, not by implementing policies. He said this in the 2003 study, I, I looked into the issue, that rather than having export crossing zones, which special economic zones are an evolution of, we, we should go back to really looking at the livelihoods, providing research in agriculture, yeah. infrastructure, so on and so forth. An interesting point mm -hmm. of Secretary Balasakan in that same 2003 study mm -hmm. states, mm -hmm. there is a significant and negative correlation also mm -hmm. between dynasties mm -hmm. and poverty. Yeah. When there, are, there is a dynasty in a province, people tend to be poorer, and that can be proven with economic statistics. All right, uh, there you heard it from the expert, uh, Mr. Jerry Cruz. Thank you so much for getting right here on Talk to Harry. See, do dynasties really work for us, or is it anti-development? On the next segment of Talk to Harry, we are going to have Lente, or the Legal Network for Truthful Elections, talking to us about election offenses right here. Don't go anywhere, so stay tuned. Thank you so much. It's good. <laughs>